Cool. Yeah, right. sounds good. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. Good to be back. I have three days off, which is kind of strange. Two of those were planned. Of course, one of those was because of a banana tree. And yes, uh, Richard says, why do you have a banana tree in your backyard? I have four avocado trees. I have a fruit salad tree. I have a peach tree. I have uh, five different types of guavas. And I have about 20 to 25 uh, banana trees on my property. So I'll show you some pictures later on of the culprit, which caused the fiber optic snappage and... Uh, it's caused me to not do a show, but uh, a shout out to AT&T. Normally dealing with these ISPs and phone companies, they're all just appallingly bad customer service. I was expecting them to come out maybe in like a month to fix my fiber optic. It came out today, next day did it, and uh, so props to AT&T, great service. I, I can't believe I'm actually giving them props, but that was that was the start of my day. All right, hello, uh, Naum, Big Eb, Raj, Richard, Gretchen, Ivzy, Terry, Tom. We got a whole big group today. Vernon, Gretchen, Tomasina, Jorge, good to see you guys all back in the fray. Now, I wanted to do something a little bit different um, because I normally don't break down an entire sector as a show, but you guys might remember I had Colin Tedderds on from the Investor Channel a few weeks back who just does amazing analysis of fundamentals, and I thought, you know what, why don't we sprinkle that together as kind of a tandem show where the two of us go back and forth on the financials because two weeks ago they reported earnings, and most of them, it was like hallelujah type of earnings, but if you watch the bank stocks recently, it's not so hallelujah. It's almost sinking of the Titanic-ish. So without further ado, we'll go to our guest who's joining us from the great city of California as well. Probably not any fires like here in Southern California. We have Colin Tedder. It's Colin, good to see you. Hey, Merlin. Great to be on the show. Thanks for having me back on again. I appreciate that. Oh, I'm, I'm, you're going to be a regular on this program. I, you know that, yeah, right? I love it. <laughs> I love it. Thanks. I appreciate it. Um, all right. Well, you're a fundamentals guy. You love diving into the fundamentals. And of course, every quarter we get this onslaught of information, whether you trust that information or not, uh, that reflects kind of how those companies have performed, their management, allocations of capital. And I thought it'd be good for us to talk about the financial sector, because that really, from my perspective, kicks off all of earnings season. Uh, you had JP Morgan beat by 24% on earnings. You had Wells Fargo beat by 19. Bank of America beat, uh, sorry, uh, Goldman Sachs beat by 73%. Ally beat by 73%. The only loser in this was Bank of America down 4% on the expectations, yet as a sector as a whole, this last couple weeks has been rather ugly for financial. So what, do you, what have you seen in those financial numbers that might paint a negative picture for the banking industry? Well, you know, what it's getting wrapped up kind of in the, I mean, the, the whole market's obviously selling off as well. But the banks in general, what's happening is the Federal Reserve has telegraphed that these companies cannot raise their dividend or do any buybacks. I think it was through the end of it was like halfway through the end of this year and then they extended, extended it yep. into the end of next year and so no one really knows they could come back in in next month or in december and say look you can't do it in the first quarter of 2021 either and so i think that not just that i i you know in the short term those dividends it's not that big of a deal but i think people are wondering well what is the fed seeing inside these banks balance sheet what's the fed seeing inside the economy that's making them say Yo, banks, you can't uh, outlay any capital to dividends or buybacks. And I think in general, that has people nervous because they're saying, well, what does the Fed know about the, the 2021 economy and then maybe the financial position that these banks are in? And I think that's what has people nervous. And if you look at the valuations of these banks, they're at, uh, you know, basically almost at year lows and in some cases all time lows. If you look at it from like a tangible book value, a lot of these banks are selling at, at really attractive prices. So you'd expect them to maybe catch a bid. And then, like you said, they had a, gr for the most part, great earnings. Mm -hmm. And they just have not caught a bid, and they've they've kind of continued sideways or gone down. And I, I think it's a it's some uneasiness about the future, 
and also the CEOs. If you listen to the conference call, listen to Jamie Dimon, listen to the Bank of America CEO, they weren't exactly on the conference call, uh, you know, singing sunshines and roses. Right. Okay, a lot of them were predicting maybe a, a double dip recession. You know, 2021 is when they're going to realize a lot of losses. So I, I just think there's just a lot of uncertainty, and that's kind of why I like to look at the banks. Not necessarily because I'm trying to add a bunch of Bank of America to my portfolio, but it kind of gives you an idea on what the banks are looking at is the economy, the consumer, the debt inside the economy. Mm -hmm. And if all that is not looking good, well, guess what? Probably all other equity prices and, and equity values are probably not looking as great uh, heading into the next year, at least on paper right now. Yeah, I'd agree with you. And I think it's interesting because historically, and, and I don't like to polarize any particular political party, but historically, you know, Republicans have been very good for the banks. And what we've seen recently might make you think that they're pricing in, you know, maybe Trump uh, not making it into a second term, which, you know, we can all debate that and we'll never, we probably won't know until the end of the year really who's won that election. Uh, let me show you guys some charts here of these stocks just so you can get an idea of what they look like because they, they certainly are downtrodden, although some are much, much worse worse and um, you know I think there comes a point where you might want to look at potentially adding some of these banks uh, to your portfolio I think that Colin's right I think some of them are looking attractive there's others that you probably want to stay away from here we'll start with Bank of America this is the only one that really missed their earnings number they were supposed to make 53 cents a share came out at 51 cents um, this is a weekly so it is pricing in these last two candles here are since the earnings announcement You'll notice, obviously, the COVID hit. That That's normal for everybody. But even leading into COVID, they were really sideways, slightly drifting up. But it really wasn't anything noteworthy from a technical perspective. Now, J.P. Morgan, um, their picture looks pretty much the same as Wells Fargo or at uh, Bank of America. Um, you know, still not back up to its highs of 140 plus that is established in early February. But, you know, you know, JP Morgan's probably not going to go into our biggest retailer out there, Chase, and then um, Wells Fargo. Now, Wells Fargo, out of all of these, is interesting because Warren Buffett has definitely been unloading some of his position in Wells Fargo. He may have gotten out of all of it. Um, this is why. I mean, Wells Fargo, for whatever reason, whether it's uh, them lying and getting sued for creating fake accounts and all that garbage, this chart looked ugly well before the pandemic hit. I mean, it was drifting down lower for two years since 2018 highs, looking ugly. Now, out of all of these four that I've just looked at, you know, many are, have been sending in comments and questions about WFC saying, well, where do you see it going? Where's the target for this one? Honestly, you know, I think you could potentially get back to those 2009 lows. Here's a monthly chart of this one. Um, I certainly don't look at the fundamentals like Colin does, but Colin, did, did you do analysis on, on Wells Fargo? Is there anything in there that might be a, a little golden nugget or something of value? Because right now, the only thing I would say for Wells Fargo is stay out of its way. It's going to keep on going down. Yeah, you know what? Uh, from a price, uh, what I take, I don't typically look at PE ratios and price to sales. Don't take them into big, uh, you know, big account when you're looking at maybe like the tech stocks or, or almost any sector. But the bank sector is a little bit different. You can really look at tangible book. In fact, if you break open the the company's financials, they typically put the tangible book value of the company inside the report. And Wells Fargo, from a price to tangible book value, is actually at, at least from the data that I'm seeing, at an all-time low, at least from back uh, about 20 years now. And so, you know, investors are just not buying up this stock. I think they had a dividend cut. They're probably, out of all the banks, probably not in a position to do a big buyback, to add or increase a dividend. And so I just think from an investment standpoint, and then I think as you pointed out from a chart perspective, just nothing is looking good with Wells Fargo. And then you roll on top of that kind of the bad goodwill or the bad juju that they that they had like creating customer accounts and, and they're still kind of working past that. They still have a powerful position inside the United States, have mm. a lot of customers, they have access to, to a lot of clients, 
But just, you know, if you were to pick between them and J.P. Morgan or Bank of America or Citigroup or any of these other banks that you could potentially put money, I think you'd rather go with one of the other ones. And then also, like you said, Warren Buffett, I, I don't think we've gotten confirmation yet, but it is believed that he is completely out of his Wells Fargo position, which uh, certainly is, is a, a surprise because that was one of his uh, more significant positions. So if Warren Buffett bails out on Wells Fargo. Do I really want to jump in now when the, you know, the Oracle of Omaha is out of a stock? Do right. I think that, I, that I personally uh, should jump in, but from a valuation perspective, look, it's, it's getting there. I, I just don't think we're, we're, we're there yet with Wells Fargo and, and maybe some of these other banks as well. I'm going to bring up this one for the viewers out at home. This is just so you guys can kind of get a, a little sense as to what Colin was just talking about. Uh, there's a website. There's a ton of them out there. Keep in mind, a lot of this is going to be delayed. It's going to be, you know, there's a reporting period for people like Warren Buffett. Uh, this one's called Guru Focus. Uh, I have no affiliation or not receiving any kickback, so take it for what it's worth. Um, you'll notice right here, airlines he's out of. Right? He, he's made that very clear. He dumped out of airlines early. Um, this year, or actually not earlier, but mid this year, Delta, Southwest, United, and American all dumped out of. He's really been reducing his financial exposure. You can see he's completely sold out of Goldman Sachs. He has reduced his uh, Bank of New York Mellon. He's reduced his PNC Financials. He's reduced uh, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo. Now, I say that he's reduced Wells Fargo. He still has, and brace yourself, 237 million shares of Wells Fargo. So, you know, let, let's be fair here. He's getting his butt handed to him on this one um, right now. But, you know, who knows if he's completely out of it or not. Colin's right. We don't know until the reporting period. Uh, he reduced on the previous report, which was in June, uh, by 26% on his Wells Fargo position. So even people like Warren Buffett uh, have been unloading that one, and probably for good reason. I mean, I don't want to have this one in my portfolio, uh, given how far it's dropping. Now, to be fair, you guys remember Warren Buffett made an amazing deal with Bank of America back in 2009 where not only did he go and technically just bail him out and bought a ton of shares, but he also got warrants. So you look at his, some of his biggest gaining positions he's ever had, Bank of America probably is high on that list because I think his average price was something like $4 or $3 with the warrants and the price that he bought in at. And I'll bring up the Bank of America chart here for you guys just to show you where that one went. Um, so, you know, buying in at five bucks and getting out at, in somewhere near the 55 mark. Yeah, he's still up huge on this position, but he certainly has given back a lot of it. Um, all right, so Colin, you were talking about you know how the the dividend piece, which that has been extended. Um, I don't know if it's through the end of the year. I didn't get some exact date on that one, but from an investor's perspective, I know you, you, you've talked to a lot of investors out there, probably more than I do, and a lot of the, the focus is to collect that dividend, right? To see, hey, I've got something and I want to get that steady stream of income payments. Uh, I think Bank of America was doing a 3% dividend yield. Great, okay, I know I can ride out some ups and downs because I'll get that dividend yield. Well, right now, any bank over, I believe it's $100 billion in assets is now prohibited from making any dividend payments. What do you think that does from a uh, kind of a, I guess, uh, an interest perspective? Because it would, my assumption would be that the average retail investor is going to look at that and go, I had like financials, but I'm not getting the dividend I'm used to. I might go to oil companies or I might go to some other sector where I can get that dividend deal. Do you think that there's going to be a shift there? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, at least in the short term uh, that absolutely, uh, you know, you have Old, you know, older people or people in retirement is probably a better way to say it that rely on that income. And mm -hmm. so, if that dividend, you know, they don't necessarily necess need that dividend to grow. But people like me that are investing maybe in Bank of America or JP Morgan, I'm investing primarily for that dividend growth because I want to buy in now at a certain yield and just let that money compound and compound over a long period of time. And if Wells Fargo and JP Morgan and Bank of America, if they're not allowed to increase that dividend, and I don't know when, it, it, right now, it, it's still an open-ended question when they're able to do that. For sure, I'd rather look at Verizon or I'd rather look at maybe AT&T who turned your internet back on. I'd rather look <laughs> at other sectors out there and even maybe like Apple and, and other companies out there that have a little bit more a little bit more investor interest and a little more clarity on their business going forward I, I think that but here's here's the but 
at some point, the Fed is going to reverse that decision. They're going to yeah. say, hey, it's all clear. You guys can you know, do a buyback, do a dividend. Then what happens? Do the floodgates open and they increase them by more than we expect? Do they execute this huge you know, multi-billion dollar buyback? Do the charts then pivot at that point? And one thing I, I'm probably interested in hearing your opinion on is my guess is that the insiders are going to know that decision before us, the retail investor. Okay, the Fed is gonna telegraph to the banks that yes, starting January 15th or whatever, you can do dividends, you can do buybacks. Okay, they're gonna know way before us, the retail investor knows. And so do the charts start indicating that? Because uh, that'd be interesting to me. Like, mm -hmm. it will it be a pivot point for these stocks? Will they kind of round out? Will it, I don't, I don't necessarily see these stocks. They, they just don't react the same way like a tech stock or maybe a biotech stock on that kind of news. But will the stock like show a bottom and, and reversal when that news is available? I just don't think we're going to know it as the average investor first. But I am certainly interested in maybe front running that if I can, see it in the charts, see it in a little mm -hmm. bit of price action, because once they announce it to the general public, I think you will have some retail investors kind of say, oh, well, I can get back into Bank of America, I can get back into Citigroup or, or these dividend paying banks, because now they're allowed to do the buyback, now they're allowed to do a dividend and dividend raise. And there's kind of like that question like, how big are they? They're probably, you know, a lot of these banks are really healthy. JP Morgan, Bank of America, yeah. they're doing pretty darn good, honestly. And so they could easily raise that dividend, do a nice buyback, and at these share prices certainly would be attractive. So that's really what I am really keeping an eye on, I think, over the next I, probably three months or so. I, I agree with you 100%. I think, yes, you can see it coming in, but you have to put yourself in the perspective of if I'm JP Morgan and I look to start buying back my own shares or even shares of my competitors because I know that this will be the same for Bank of America, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, whoever's buying, you know, uh, this restriction is lifted off of, they're not going to go out there and all of a sudden just start buying right away. And, and you're absolutely right. I, there's a joke that goes around. That it, it, it's no longer called government sacks. It's uh, sorry. It's no longer Goldman Sachs. It's government sacks yeah. because they have so many people in high political offices. I mean, it's like it's like the most organized fraternity gang you could possibly imagine is Goldman Sachs. I mean, they they literally have people on on the board of the governments in Canada and Europe and central banks all over the world because hey, this is a fraternity piece. And I'm sure when Canada does something, the Goldman Sachs guy that's entrenched in the political office there is like, hey, um, you know, we're gonna make some decision here. I'm gonna be pushing for this, and we'll probably pass it. You know, that won't be retail information for another couple weeks or a couple months. Will we be able to see it in the price chart? Certainly we will. And I think what you'll get is you'll probably get a lot of options buying really to use the power of leverage for these firms. And then they'll go in and incrementally start to slowly push that price up. And at a certain point, the retail investor will jump in. And it um, to me, that is, that's the way it's gonna happen. And you just kind of have to look at price charts to see you know when you start to see those turns. I, I think that what we could play here or the play would be, you know for a fact at some point that restriction will be lifted. So the, it begs the question, at what point am I happy to buy a stock like JP Morgan, like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, knowing that those restrictions are going to lift and I could see a significant move back up as the retail investor comes in because of the dividends again. And you know, there was a comment that came through earlier saying um, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan are probably the best banks in my opinion. You know, just looking at the charts, I'm going to, I'm going to bring this, let's do it on a monthly first, just so you guys see the longer term perspective. To me, if I look at growth and what's been happening from a fundamental or a technical perspective, I really like JP Morgan. I mean, JP Morgan was just showing really, really good growth. If you look at Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo was, yeah, I mean, it had it, but something fundamentally is done with Wells Fargo. I'm not saying that you never want to buy into it again. I mean, we can talk about some of the numbers, but you know, this this looks like there's some major issue going. And someone mentioned it looks like Lehman Brothers. I don't know if I go that far, but they do have some big problems. Um, I, let's look at Bank of America real quickly. You know, Bank of America still hasn't breached those all-time highs. It's it's showed some strength, but it's not great at this moment. Um, one that I do like, which uh, maybe we can get some of the viewers' perspectives on this one. All of the ones we're looking at here are brick and mortar with an online presence. If you look at ALLY, Ally Financial, 
here's a, a an online bank that obviously had a huge sell-off, but it you know it looks decent. And if it's just an online presence, I mean, most of us now are pretty much living in our homes and not really needing the brick and mortar anymore. Certainly with technology, uh, that might be another play. And then Goldman Sachs. So if I had to pick out of all of these, which one looks the best from a technical perspective, I'm going and I'm taking JP Morgan number one. I will probably take Goldman Sachs number two just because uh, of their entrenchment around the world. I would probably take a flyer on Wells Fargo at a certain price point, you know, that price point. Um, I mean, we've recently broken through some lows where I would have been attractive buy point, like right on 23. We don't have much here as far as a traditional supply and demand perspective goes. So maybe we want to look at, um, you know, buying some leaps on this one. I think there's right now you still see some downside, but you know, Wells Fargo will turn it around. If not, their assets and client base will be purchased and, and that you'll see that thing rebound. And Warren Buffett will step back in here and buy it at, at 10 bucks and buy the entire company on him. <laughs> Um, all right, so are there any preferences that you have with regards to these, Colin? Because you, you look at the numbers more than I do. I'm just looking at the chart because charts are pretty. Uh, has any of the, since you've analyzed them all, have any of the balance sheets really popped to you and one just so you, wow, this one looks much healthier than this one? I, okay, so I love, and I should preface that I am long Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, <laughs> uh, Goldman Sachs, a couple other ones, a Citigroup, everybody except for Wells Fargo out of the majors. So I like them from a, you know, pr quite frankly, the, the balance sheets look fine. They're provisioning loan losses. So if people don't know that the banks, what they do is they set aside money in advance for loans going bad. Mm -hmm. And normally it's not that big of a deal, but obviously we had the pandemic hit here in the United States around the March timeframe, that was Q1. Q2, these banks just boosted those by exponential rates, rates that I, I haven't seen them do that since the 08, 09 financial crisis. In the last quarter, they flattened those out. So they kind of went back to normal in Q3. Now, a lot of the CEOs kind of telegraph that, look, the, we have money set aside, but if the economy gets really bad, we probably don't have enough money set aside. Mm -hmm. We might have more than enough, but we might have, I think uh, JP Morgan said, we might, I think they have about 10 billion set aside. Mm -hmm. They say it could be $20 billion. <laughs> and so that's, I mean, we are at just an astronomical range. I mean, $10 billion, that's an astronomical range. And so uh, to get back to the question, I like the major banks from the balance sheet perspective, but also from a government perspective like regulation uh, pers perspective. I don't like to tie in government, but with the banks, they're so intertwined. I think a lot of people, if you have a good memory, you remember back to 08, 09, you could drive around your neighborhood, you saw community banks, you saw regional banks, mm -hmm. you saw smaller name banks, but a lot of the regulation that has passed makes these banks have huge financial requirements, huge right. capital requirements. They have these stress tests that they have to go through every, I think every quarter mm -hmm. or so. And that has made it to where the only banks that can really do that are the Bank of America's, the right. JP Morgan's, the Citigroup's, the big gigantic banks. So I tend to focus in on those. You brought up Ally Financial and just, I looked at their their financials really quick. They say that they're adjusted tangible and I don't know exactly how they're adjusting it. It could be you know, some uh, some adjustment there, but, but they say their adjustable tangible book value is $34 a share. I'm looking right now. The shares are at 26, 26 uh, yeah. 50 or so. And so a, a lot of these banks are at a, in, under a little bit more normal circumstances, I'd be allocating quite a bit into these banks uh, because everything looks pretty good. They have money set aside for these loan losses that we have to assume will materialize at, at some point, okay? We're not seeing it really in the credit card data yet. We're not seeing it in the used card. We're certainly not seeing it in the real estate market yet. We're seeing it a little bit in the business uh, segment as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of businesses obviously are closing, those loans default, but um, you know, who knows what's going to happen in the next three to six to maybe 12, even 24 months with the average consumer. Uh, that's that's up in the air. And the final piece, the final piece is that all these banks 
are not really loaning is more money quarter over quarter. That's the other thing that I noticed. You get data on how much money they've lent out to the consumer and they've really tightened their lending standards. If you try to go out and get a mortgage right now, if you try to go out and get some kind of loan, it is actually a lot more difficult than it was obviously the pre-pandemic. And mm -hmm. so these banks are pulling back on the loans that, that they're giving. And that is going to impact uh, their revenues and things going forward. It also doesn't give investors that much hope for the future. If they're not out there actively lending, it's showing you that, look, these banks are probably not as competent about the future as well. So I just, it's a, it, it's a great sector because not only are you getting a window into the biggest banks, the biggest money center banks, you get a window into the consumer as well. And so, but, if somebody were to hold a, a pistol to my head, I'm only going to invest in the big, gigantic money center banks because it doesn't matter who wins the election, but any kind of regulation on these banks is going to benefit the, the big guys. Uh, the last thing you could invest in is the ETF. I think the biggest ETF right now is the, the XLF. Right. Uh, that would be, if you don't want to try to pick winners and losers, to me, that would be just the safest uh, possible sector, or the safest possible investment you could make into the financial sector. Guys, on the chart here, as he was walking through it, I, I brought it up here. I have a sector comparison chart. And just to go back into January 2020, the, the first day of the trading year, you can see that really until February, there wasn't a lot of ripples. You know, some, some were breaking apart, uh, making some ups, some downs. But right now, um, you've got the worst performer, and, and given what we saw with the financials, you might think that they would be doing worse. They, they just started to sell off a bit, but uh, energy's the worst. Uh, still down 54% on the year for XLE, uh, which, you know, my gut's just telling me, bye, 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 because it's got to rally back up, but it has been underperforming for years. So the next one you got on there is the XLE, uh, XLF, the financials. That's down 24%. You'll notice that the, the magnitude of the sell-off over the past, let's say, two weeks it's actually not as strong with the financials as it is with the top ones up here, which is going to be technology. Um, but still, technology semiconductors, that has taken a huge dump over the past couple of weeks. You're also seeing some weakness come in in the S&P overall. Um, it seems a bit more accelerated. Just wanted to show this as a comparison so you can kind of see that even though I'm we're kind of painting a, a little bit of a grim picture here with financials, in the past couple of weeks, they have not been as weak as the other areas. Now, as uh, Colin was mentioning, probably the best way to get into that would be XLF if you don't want to be picking winners or losers out there. Um, but th there's there's certainly some some better performers. And, and uh, Jerry says, which one is the prettiest girl in the ugly dance? Jerry, for me, I'm going to say personally because of the technicals, I'm saying JP Morgan. I don't know if there's a better one of, of those two, Colin, that you like uh, from a fundamental perspective. Uh, you know what? I love JP Morgan because they have a window into so much stuff, okay? Credit cards, auto loan, mortgages, mm -hmm. businesses, uh, trading. They're, they're like in everything. And I think if you want to split hairs too, they probably have the the best CEO, the most respected CEO. Uh, so in, in my opinion, again, I have long JP Morgan, so it's easy for me to say <laughs> this. But, uh, you, you know, I... If, I like them from a, a large percentage. And you look at their balance sheet, you look at their financials, even in a low interest environment, they're still returning uh, quite a bit of money on, on their capital that they're outlaying. Uh, they're probably, you know, they're probably doing the best in terms of uh, managing their entire portfolio. And they're probably one of the largest banks out there with the broadest amount of exposure to to large parts of the market whereas mm -hmm. some banks might be more business related I'd probably try to avoid them some might just be into the consumer segment I'd probably avoid them as well uh, there's some other finance like BlackRock and Schwab that are doing really well because of trading and things like that are probably at all-time highs and things like that but in terms of the money center banks uh, JP Morgan and probably Bank of America are, are probably would top my list in terms of uh, the ones that I get the most excited about. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, uh, Batista says bonds up, yields down, and banks down. Yeah, you know one of the, and I think that that might tie into what Colin was just talking about, guys. Is 
that you would think that right now that it'd be just the, the ultimate time to be going and getting, you know, refi in your home and get a new, buy a new piece of property, which should stimulate the economy. But remember when banks, if you're looking at a 30 year fix at under 3%, Banks aren't making a lot of money on that deal. So not only is it a risk for them because of the potential unemployment problem for uh, the average investor, but also their margin on those loans aren't that great. So I think that that might be one of the factors why they're not being as uh, accommodative with their lending policies. I've been hearing about that as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not looking for any money right now or getting a loan, but I do know people that have had some challenges with regards to that. And I think that, that it's, it's a twofold thing. Number one, they're not going to loan you money if they're not really making anything on it. What's the point? Uh, and number two, that, that risk factor of defaulted loans. And, and we've seen those numbers spike significantly. And, and Colin, you mentioned, I think it was JP Morgan or somebody saying they got $10 billion you know, set aside for defaulted loans. And it's like, well, you know, it could be $20 billion. And you're like, when? I, you know, I look at my checking account. I know how much I have there. I don't need to, <laughs> I'm not that wild in my swings of estimates as far as what I need. But, um, yeah. you know, those are, are certainly things that we need to think about. You know, we if right now we're reading a lot of stats and who knows whether you guys think this is an absolute scam or an absolute critical pandemic, whatever you think, COVID is here. And, you know, if the second wave, as everyone says, is about to hit or hitting right now, then we might see a lot more people unemployed. That would lead to more people defaulting on their loans. That would lead to bank stocks getting clobbered. So, you know, it's tricky, man. I don't know how you, if you're in it for the long, long, long haul, I think there's a great buying opportunity. If you're a shorter term guy, you gotta be careful because you could see six, eight, 12 months of more downside movement if people start defaulting and these banks hit some hard times. So, you know, it's always a speculation type of thing where you have to make that judgment call for your own personal, um, your own personal benefit. I personally think that this next second wave of COVID won't be that bad. I hope you're. I hope you're right. And I think you know you made the point on if you're in for the long haul with these, uh, you know, trying to pick pennies or try to pick the bottoms of these stocks. Not necessarily something you necessarily have to do. Uh, what I would recommend though is inching in. So mm -hmm. say you had a thousand dollars that you wanted of of J P Morgan stock. Well, with trading fees at, at zero, um, I would inch into it because if Jamie Dimon's right and uh, next year in 2021, they have $20 billion or $25 billion of loan losses and they have to allocate even more money to that, well, the stock is going to you know, sell off even more. And mm -hmm. so, and the book value of the stock is going to go down. The value of its portfolio is going to go way down. And probably interest rates are going to go down. Look, if the recession gets even worse, I know that rates are at quote unquote zero, but they could go lower. Okay. You know, like interest rates have gone negative in parts of the world. Not necessarily saying that's, uh, that has uh, the odds of that happening in the United States are high, but I would inch into any of these uh, bank stocks because if you listen to the management, it's really their job to sell you on buying into the stock yeah. and they are not being great salesmen right now. And so I would tip toe into it because also the the other wild card we talked about is the Fed could come out in December and say sorry banks for the next 12 months no dividends right. no buybacks and, and then then the, you know then your money is probably worth especially over 12 months probably worth uh, looking at other sectors looking at, at something else uh, especially if you're looking for dividend dividend growth things like that yeah, um, I had a whole train of thought. I had a great thought track going there, and I, I, I lost it. I just looked away for a second, and it's gone. I, this is what happens when you get old. I, I, I'm, I'm losing it. Um, you you mentioned – here's what it was. You mentioned um, – I believe you said J.P. Morgan, Damon, saying he's got you know $10 billion set aside for this. And you know the tough part here is they've got a team of probably 1,000 analysts all trying to figure out exactly – where they stand and what the potential def because it's a guesstimate at this point for them. Now, you you offered one scenario there, and I think we could look at the other way as well. And let's say that they've allocated ten billion dollars for loan write-offs or, or fall defaults on those loans. And you know, if it gets to twenty billion dollars, well, shit, they're in trouble, right? You could see some some downside move in their stock because they were underprepared. But what if we've got government forbearance on you know on on for, on loans right now, right? They'll that means that they're just gonna let you miss your payments, but they'll tack it onto the end so you don't default. They're just stretching it down till you get your job back. And if that is a big enough factor for a lot, of, I know a couple people that are taking advantage of that right now, 
Um, that will prevent that number of defaults. All of a sudden, Jamie Dimon could come out at the end of this with JP Morgan and say, hey, we allocated 10 billion and it was only 5 billion. Boom, there you got a $5 billion surplus and all of a sudden this stock could go rocketing up. I think to me personally, that's probably a more likely scenario given you know, people are getting back to work. It seems like things are slowly getting back to normal. No, I can't, uh, you know, go to a bar and party till 2 a.m. This is the story we'll tell our kids, guys. God, Timmy, you remember I used to go to a bar and stay till 12 without a mask or 2 in the morning. Nowadays, man, you got to be out by 9 o'clock. It's, it's crazy. But I, I think that's probably the more realistic scenario is it's not going to be as extreme. Everyone set their forecast so ridiculously low on earnings. They're all just shattering that. I think they'll probably be doing the same thing with that uh, money allocated for loans at $10 billion. No, uh, yeah, and I, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think we're gonna hit the worst case scenario. I don't think we're gonna hit the best case scenario. Oftentimes, it, it, you know, it's somewhere right there in the middle. And with the, you know, the worst case scenario is pretty bad. And I think it's starting to get priced in, at least with these bank stock, and certainly in the energy sector as well. And I think you're right. If things start turning around, if you know, we see in the consumer data that uh, consumers have money. Okay, they're not yeah. going out and eating. They're not flying necessarily. They're not uh, maybe upgrading their car or anything like that. And so consumers have money, and a lot of them are refinancing out of their houses, putting money uh, that money into their pocket as well. And and so, uh, you know, it, it could be that uh, banks come out on the other side of this and have, you know, plenty of reserves left for these loans that have that could potentially go bad. They don't go bad. And then we see a loosening of credit standards because I know I actually know just anecdotal data for myself. It is incredibly hard right now to, I don't want to say hard, but it is a, a, a tenuous process to get approved on a, a rather just a simple loan, a simple mortgage or something like that. Even when you have all the money, all the credit, all the everything lined up, they're still running you through hoops. And this is what I'm hearing from other real estate investors that I talk to as well. It is not easy right now. And so once all that starts to loosen up a little bit and we kind of come out on the other side of this, who knows when it'd be. Maybe it's in Q1, Q2, Q3 next year, but at some point it happens. And yeah, I don't necessarily see these stocks uh, snapping back. That typically doesn't happen with the banking sector, but I think you could get a trend reversal on these things and just have you know four or five quarters mm -hmm. where you, you know you 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 shoot up 20, 30 percent on this on these types of stocks, and you buy them right, you get lock in that dividend yield, and you start reinvesting that money, and all of a sudden you've got a, a home run investment, especially if you're in it for the short run but in the long run as well yeah i agree uh, guys uh just so we can wrap it up i want to keep you all day uh colin tedders is our guest i've got the his youtube channel over here we've had him on before but guys check it out uh he's got all, all the different stocks they're generally hot stocks of course he's gonna be a very busy guy thursday evening as we have three mm. monstrous companies reporting earnings on thursday but uh, one nice thing or there's a lot of great things here but again if there's a specific company that you guys want him to check out he's probably not going to analyze any penny stocks right is if it's a legit no big high volume company you can put it down in the comments below he's pretty good about fielding the comments although he's his channel's blowing up here recently so he might take a little bit longer to get back to you but uh, colin's always pretty good about if you put a stock in there you want to analyze he'll break it down for you and i think it's uh, a resource you guys should be using yeah appreciate that you know what yeah no penny stocks and quite frankly i'm kind of like you uh no biotech <laughs> or healthcare because i have taken i have learned so many lessons and lost uh, a fair amount of money try and I've done all the research looked at the slides looked at read the conference calls I am t I, I couldn't pass a science class in, in yeah. college so it, you know you no, just never uh, know yeah. it's like one yeah. one drug approval or miss it's like it's an 80 percent oh. gain or loss you're like ah screw it I'm done <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. So in those cases, so you probably have people listening that are probably in the same boat. Maybe it's the banking sector. Maybe it's tech sector. That's when you go for ETFs. Yep. Uh, when, when you cannot pick the individual stocks, when you don't want to pick winners or losers, I, I think you still, in a long-term portfolio, you still want exposure to that. So go over to the ETFs and things like that. And, and there's obviously tons of them out there. Awesome. Well, Colin, thank you so much for coming on today. Appreciate it. Uh, I look. I, I'll figure out what the next one is. Maybe in a few weeks we'll go all the the Fang stock analysis. But love having you on. Thanks for all the work yeah. you do.
Thank you, Merlin. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on again. I appreciate it. All right, take care. Guys, that was Colin Tedderts of the Investor Channel. I would encourage you guys to check that one out if you haven't done so already. Mm -hmm. Always got some great information out there, and I think he he's always going through all the, the big the main stocks, you know, the stocks everybody wants to know. And what I like better than watching any of these a-holes on CNBC or Fox or Bloomberg is all of those guys have an agenda. Uh, you notice right away, Colin was saying, look, I'm long JP Morgan, I'm long Bank of America, I'm long Goldman Sachs, but he also gave objective reasons why. Uh, and you can probably look deeper into his channel into the financial numbers, I think, are uh, the, the real value behind his channel. So check that one out, the Investor Channel. All right, um, a few comments that came through here. Um, the short, you know what? <sighs> There was a good question that came in from Jerry's or comment. He says, "I think Sweden got it right from the beginning. Hindsight's 2020, right? Well, in I, I agree with you now. I think Sweden had the right approach. What if the number with regards to the fatality rate was significantly higher, and we just didn't know it yet? And Sweden all of a sudden becomes very, uh, let's just say, underpopulated because it was wiping people out." I think there were, our governments were a little too overreactive and, and, and just slamming everything shut. If you look at the mortality rates on it, you know, obviously we don't want anybody to die. I, I usually have a pretty big Halloween party every year, and, and I'm, I canceled that this year just because I, I, I wanted to be socially responsible. It's tough for me, a guy who likes to dress up in costume every year, to not do so. Um, but I think, you know, you got to be careful out there with it. Uh, certainly, if you know somebody who has an autoimmune issue or might be more susceptible to COVID, I like to think I'm in a pretty good, healthy place. And I don't think it would impact me if I did get it, even though I've been tested multiple times for travels. Um, you know, in hindsight, Sweden may have gotten it right. I think it's a, a gross overreaction to it. But, you know, I, better safe than sorry might be the the uh, phrase to use for that one. What else we got here? Um Batista, where's the stimulus? I need some Xbox. Just in time for Christmas. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, what is the right unemployment number if it's trending down? Well, I, I think the unemployment number, there's the U3 rate, which is paints a rosier picture of the number. The real U, um, U6 rate is what we should be looking at because it shows people who've kind of given up on looking for a job. Let's see if I can find uh, the U6 rate for you. It's tough to type and talk at the same time, I'm telling you. Um, here is the U6, not macro trends. This is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so I'll show you this one right here. Here is um, the number. So right now they're saying that uh, seasonally adjusted, we're looking at uh, September's 7.9%, all right? So we're, we're, it's dropping, which is great, but they're saying if you look at the U6 rate, which is a better representation of it, uh, you have 12.2%. Uh, is the unemployment rate out there right now. So whichever one you want to use, I do think it's much, much higher. Uh, Jerry, that's a good comment. And look, obviously, um, some of us are going to be more prone to any virus than others. Um, I watched a very good podcast. And I don't normally watch or listen to podcasts. So, um, you know, I, some of you guys have suggested other people to bring on. I should probably go and do that to grow this show. Um, but Joe Rogan had something on right at the beginning of the pandemic. And he had a guy on who... I believe he's one of the top, you know, immunovirus guys at the University of Minnesota, and he was saying there's really three or four things that you can do to help yourself and protect yourself from COVID. Number one, and this was the toughest one, he started right off the bat and he goes, "Stop drinking alcohol." It's like, damn it. Guess I'm, I'm guess I'm susceptible. I mean, you know, I like to have my frosty beverages every now and again. Uh, part of the reason is it, it it can mess with your immune system and weaken your immune system. Number two, he says eat healthier, right? Get rid of the big fats that could maybe cause issues for your system, you know? Instead of eating out of McDonald's or Burger King all the time, maybe go get salads and eat something healthier. Number three was get to get uh, exercise. Make sure you're out there exercising and getting your body in shape and condition. And number four was make sure you get a lot of sleep. Challenging for somebody like myself who has insomnia, but I look at most of those, I like to think I'm doing my best to stay in shape, eat a bit healthier than I normally would. Um, I don't drink a lot. Uh, you guys might think I do based off my Friday show, but uh, those are the things that we can all do. And I think that, uh, you know, especially the way COVID has hit, it gives us all the opportunity to stay at home. So, you know what? Start working out. Pull, pull, bust out your P90X. Bust out some uh, Tabata exercises or high intensity interval training and, you know, do jumping jacks or push ups or sit ups or something just to get yourself in better shape and do it every day. Run a little bit, get some routine going. Anyway, not going to pontificate on what we need to do to keep ourselves healthy. Uh, I told you guys earlier that I might show you some pictures of the banana, the culprit. So we're going to go to a black screen right here. Um, 
this is so basically I, I planted one of these trees these get to be about 20 to 25 feet tall um, and yes they look like crap right now the wind just beat up everything in my yard but um, here we have uh, banana trees and I zoomed in a little bit here on the second picture you guys see this little pod right here that's a banana flower so each one of these trees takes about two years to get to full height and then this seed that you look at right here pops out and then it flowers and then you get these bananas and this is the culprit which fell over that's about 45 pounds worth of bananas uh, that fell over and you can see I got another one back here in the tree here but I got about 30 30 of those or uh, 12 well, about 20 depends on I'm gonna cut some out but uh, those are the bananas on my property right now um, some of you asking about a fruit salad tree I, I cannot recommend a fruit salad tree enough uh, I like to have social gatherings and a fruit salad tree for those that don't know is basically it's you can have a, a stone fruit fruit salad tree which would be like a peaches nectarines apricots things like that mine is on one tree I have lemons limes mandarins tangelos navel oranges and valencia oranges lemons, lemons. so I have uh, six things on one tree and they simply just graft that in to one tree so it's a lemon tree but they graft on different branches and I'm telling you some of you guys might have like a lemon tree like what the hell are you gonna do with 7,000 lemons a year but if all of a sudden I have you know three branches of lemons which give me 200 lemons a year and then I got some oranges and limes and I mean it's great you have everything you need all in one tree they're called fruit salad you can get them for apples citrus or stone fruit those are the three main varieties so there you go what do you do with all those bananas I eat them you know the um, the Chiquita banana which we get from the stores you know that's a chemical banana that that's a manufactured banana it's not I don't think it's as good as the other ones the ones I have in this picture here are called Java blue and they're they're shorter they're smaller but they taste like vanilla custard they're a really amazing flavor but it, you know if you're not used to it you're like oh this isn't a chiquita banana i like these actually better unfortunately those are going to get thrown away um these are this is all waste right here the one in the back will i'll get to to fruition okay now you guys got we got bank stocks we got fundamentals we talked covid we talked health and exercise and now we're talking about planting and horticulture all right, uh, let me go back through here. I want to show you just some of the stuff that happened today. And then obviously tomorrow is a monster. Or what's today? When, today's, today's Wednesday. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I, are any of you coming to the session tonight? I know it was, um, they made an announcement about a presentation I'm giving in the Irvine Center tonight for Online Trading Academy. But they asked if I would. And I said, sure. Uh, it sold out right away. So I apologize for those of you who can't make it in. I'll try to do some other um, events for the grads at Online Trading Academy here in the near future. And hopefully we can... Uh, See you guys there. All right. So let me go to your earnings calendar, see what we got cooking. This is the economic calendar. It happened today. Now, of course, we had multiple rate announcements. We have one from Canada, which was in line with expectations. Not really anything major happening there. It's all 25 basis points, stayed the same. Um, you have a Bank of Japan statement that was supposed to come out tonight, but they might change that. That was tentative. Here's your earnings for today. Um, I didn't see the Ford and Visa numbers come out when I took the screenshot, but you had General Electric, which had just way, way better than expected earnings. They were supposed to lose six cents. They actually made six cents. So talk about a 200% beat. That's nice. Uh, Boeing also had much better than expected earnings. Look, when you're when you're a hurdler, when you're doing a, a hurdle and the hurdle is two inches off the ground and you can't jump it, that's Boeing's earnings announcement. They cut back significantly. They're expected to lose $2.33 per share. Oh, we only lost $1.39. Yay, it's a huge beat. That's ridiculous. All right, Ford, Visa, MasterCard, and Gilead all reporting earnings today as well. Now, that's really nothing. This is what's important. Tomorrow is... I, I'm, I, I probably will literally have a bowl of popcorn. Unfortunately, it'll be cold by the time I cover it and I don't want to crunch away on the, on the popcorn while I'm doing the show. It's rare that you get a day like tomorrow. Tomorrow after market close, you see all of these are AMC, which is after market close. I mean, you've got your FANG stocks. You've got Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google. You're just missing Netflix, uh, Twitter, Starbucks, Activision, all reporting earnings tomorrow. Guys, my recommendation, and you know that's a word that we can't say anymore on Online Trinity County. You can use the word recommend because it's promissory. My recommendation is stay the hell away from the market in the last 30 minutes. Just leave it alone. You go to cash. Those moves are going to be crazy wild. Is it already priced in all the FANG stocks earnings because they perform so well? My gut tells me that it is and it might be overdone. It's just not worth the risk to get whipsawed when some of these things could drop 10, 15, 20% or rally 10, 15, 20% and you're on the wrong side of it. So I'd be very, very care uh, careful 
with regards to the earnings announcements tomorrow, it's going to be a wild one. Uh, I'll be bringing them up probably as we do the show because it's just going to be exciting. Um, you know, the show starts at two. Earnings are generally between one and two o'clock, so they'll be rolling out as we're doing the show. It's going to be wild, and who knows where the heck this market's going to go after market close tomorrow? It will be crazy. Setting up for a perfect frightful Halloween. All right, last on the list is the economic calendar for tomorrow. We have advanced GDP numbers coming out. This is a pretty important one. Um, I don't believe that this is correct. Uh, the, 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 the expectation is not that it's going to jump and gain 32%. I don't believe it's supposed to gain 32%, but the, there's your numbers there for advanced GDP. Maybe they are expecting a huge pop in GDP numbers. Um, that's the biggest announcement of the day. You do have pending home sales as well. I think real estate is still a major issue we should be looking at. You do have some big announcements from Japan with their unemployment rate. Um, and you also have, you know, I guess French GDP if you really want to look mac or micro market. But other than that, that's your major stuff going on for tomorrow. All right. Um, what time is my OTA session? Uh, it's at uh, 5 o'clock tonight. But if you're not signed up already, it's it's sold out. I've had a bunch of people ask me if I can get them in. I, I feel bad. I'm like, I can't. It's COVID. They're, they're legally limited to a certain amount of people in there. So and I still don't know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> I'm just going to walk in and just wing it like I do the show. No, I'm kidding. I have a good idea what I want to talk about. Um, all right. Let me see if I got any last minute questions here for you guys. Do, do, do. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess I owe a shout out to the Los Angeles Dodgers. Proof that you can, if you spend enough money and outpay almost every other team in Major League Baseball except for the New York Yankees, that at some point you can buy yourself a World Series. It's rather embarrassing that you spend over $110 million on your payroll and you almost got beat by a team that spent $30 million. Too bad it wasn't the Atlanta or the Tampa Bay Rays. Much better team, in my opinion, because they're not so full of themselves. But hey, you know what? After five attempts at the World Series in the past five years, uh, or four attempts in the past five years, you finally got there, so bravo, bravo. Next, let's move on to something else and talk about real team like the San Francisco 49ers. All right, uh, guys, that's going to do it for me for today. I am thinking ahead of time here on the schedule for tomorrow. Tomorrow, obviously, is going to be Thursday, I believe. I believe I'm going to have Sam Evans on the show, although I will say Sam has been so busy lately, I don't know if I can get Sam Evans on the show, but that is uh, supposed to be the the guest for tomorrow's show, and that'll be all technical analysis. So today we kind of stuck with the, the financials. Um, if there are specific companies you want Sam and I to evaluate, which we'd love to do, you can put them down below the video on our YouTube in the comment section, or go to Trader Merlin, send them in there at TraderMerlin.com, or email me directly at Trader Mer uh, at Merlin at Trader Merlin. That's a weird one. No. Is that that? No, I think it's, I think it's, I have so many Trader Merlin things out there now, I don't even know my damn email. Uh, best way is to go TraderMerlin at gmail.com. We'll just leave it at that. That makes it easier. So, all right, guys. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> That's right, Thomasina. Go Giants. San Francisco Giants, that is. <laughs> um... All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, I will see you guys on tomorrow's show again. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it. I'm glad to be back. I'm not taking any time off for quite some time. So I will see you guys tomorrow with Sam Evans on Trade and Roll. Take care.